alternative energies, invest its money in other parts of the world. Because other regions, I mentioned even Africa before, Latin America is the same thing. Look at the Far East and their regional institutions like ASEAN. Their markets are deepening, their markets are growing, they are attempting to maintain stability. You must do the same. Otherwise, the negative comments about the region that were the subtext of that Arab Human Development Report will come true. They said the Arab world risks getting left behind. This is what the map of the borderless Middle East should look like. This is the borderless Middle East that you have to build. This is the borderless Middle East that will make sure that the Arab world is once again the center of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you for this fascinating presentation. Uh, fascinating in the sense that it triggers so many questions rather than answers, in fact. Um, the first that comes to my mind is that most of the lethal and serious conflicts in this region is, is defined according to ethnic, religious, sectarian givens and not based on borders or border-related conflicts. These are the most lethal and serious problems we face. It's the, the Sunni Shiite rift in the, in the region, in the Gulf, with Iran included. It's uh, the Coptic question in Egypt. It's the ethnic, religious, um, tribal uh, conflict in Sudan. Uh, these are the kind of problems that are really stopping the Middle East from going forward. How does this fit within uh, your theory of borderless Middle East? All of the examples that you mentioned are evidence of the incredible diversity in the region, not the homogeneity in the region. That's very, very true. But there are also examples of what enriches Arab societies in ways that are not about what country they belong to, but the communities that they are. And these communities are still Arab communities. They enrich the Arab world. It's not about strengthening just Lebanon. It's not about just Egypt or about Syria, all of which have substantial minorities. It's about what contribution are they being allowed to make or being suppressed from making to the broader Arab world. So in that sense, these are transnational issues. They're not just about what is Egypt's policy, what is Syria's policy, what is Lebanon's policy. In fact, there is a common, common situation that all of them face. And there is a common response that they need to have about elevating and celebrating, I think, this diversity, which runs so contrary to the view that so many others have of the Arab world. So to strengthen that will not only strengthen the image, that's an obvious benefit, it will actually strengthen the reality of the Arab world. But how this borderless Middle East serve this goal, and in what sense? And they don't, right? The borders don't. The borders are an obstacle, I believe. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the conflicts within, within the borders in the Middle East is, is, is much more lethal and, and urgent than the trans-border yep. problems. It's, again, it's, it's the problem yep. within Iraq itself, not between Iraq and Kuwait anymore. Right. It's in Lebanon itself. It's not, between, or it's not only between Lebanon and Syria, Lebanon and Israel. It's, it's, you have the internal mm -hmm. feature of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in this sense, I, I don't see the, the question of borders is that urgent in the Middle East? Mm -hmm. I can't feel the urgency of the question of borders in the Middle East. There are certain places, and there's no global rule about this, you'll often find that when the question of Kosovo's independence, for example, has come up in the last couple of years, that Russia would resist it and China would resist it. They would say, this is a bad precedent for uh, Chechnya, or for Tibet. But in fact, every conflict is going to have its own solution. I believe that it would be beneficial for Iraq in the long term to settle the Kurdistan question and to allow it to actually have a certain independence, in which case it would have 
that international legal responsibility. Mm -hmm. So borders matter because you might be creating a new state. And yet, by dividing people legally, formally, you're making much more clear what their relationship should be. And now look at Palestine, where the same thing is absolutely true. The expectations that Israel has, the expectations that the West has for Palestine to behave a certain way are not, in fact, appropriate mm -hmm. for an entity that is not a state. It needs to have a, be a state. It needs to have borders. It needs to have recognition in order for us to have those expectations about it. So what comes with that is responsibility. And there's a, a third in the region, because you mentioned Sudan. Mm. In less than one month's time, there's going to be the referendum in South Sudan. And there too, what is better for the region in the long term? To allow that community, those people, to have their own state, and then create cooperation across those borders. Or to have a civil war over it, another civil war, continuing civil war. So when you say civil war actually is being the problem, all of these civil wars have international dimensions, all of them. They all spill over. They all destabilize the region. So there isn't even this distinction really mm -hmm. between the conflicts you're talking about and the border issues. In fact, they're very, very, very much uh, related. What you're suggesting is um, couldn't be less popular in the Middle East, which is practically partition of certain countries, uh, division of certain countries, allowing uh, independence of certain entities within, uh, within countries. You mentioned Kurdistan, you mentioned South of Sudan. This theory couldn't be less popular in any other part of the world more than it is in the Middle East. Uh, and I guess this is, there, there is a kind of cultural component involved here that, that I'm not sure we have the infrastructure to overcome. Mm -hmm. So what would be your suggestions in this sense? Just imagine how unpopular decolonization was <laughs> among the leadership <laughs> of France and Britain and European countries in the 40s and 50s. Losing India was not a small deal for the British Empire mm -hmm. after World War II. The territorial concessions that Germany had to make, of course, as well, during, the, during uh, the wars of the 20th century were also substantial. What it did was, and this is the important lesson for the Arab world, is not to view a Western conspiracy to divide and to break apart mm -hmm. the Arab world by allowing these territories to form. That is not what is at stake. One step beyond that lies a future that follows that European pattern. Because once they each splintered, once they each became nation states in the proper sense, and once they settled their borders, immediately afterwards, not 10 years later, not 20 years later, not 30 years later, mm -hmm. they formed the European Coal and Steel Community, the European Economic Community, then the European Monetary Union, and now a common European foreign and security policy. What is the most prosperous region today? Again, 27 countries, 500 million people. It all started immediately after World War II. So I'm not thinking about just if that if next step. If I may interrupt mm -hmm. here, what happened in Europe after the World War II was reconfiguring of the political system, not of the, the uh, states itself. What you're suggesting for the Middle East is reconfiguring uh, the entities, the state, not the political system in the sense of opening up the system for more political participation and, and bringing all the uh, components of a certain society into uh, political participation, proper political participation. So here you're suggesting some, something completely different than what took place in Europe. 50 years, 50 years ago. I think both have to happen at the same time. The political and social opening and liberalization mm -hmm. that many people would like to see happen within each Arab country is a component. It's not psychologically distinguishable from what needs to happen at that international level. And again, a step beyond settling the borders and the internal disputes. One step beyond that lies that integration, because each feels stable in their own skin. And that's what happened in Europe. And I do think that what it allowed them to do 
was to then build these common institutions across borders, across nationalities, that unite them in a common culture and in an institutional framework, and that's why they speak of their common Western culture. But there is, of course, a common Arab culture too. But where are those common institutions that really do work together, rather than highlighting the divisions? There are a number of groups. The GCC is there. The Arab League is there. But this is a geographic territory that not only includes the minorities that you mentioned within countries, but this is a region where there there is the geographic reality of Iran, of Israel, of Turkey. Where is the institution that brings them together? And without those institutions, the, the how will they are there? Hmm? I mean, they are weak, but they exist. Which one? The Arab the, League. No, but it doesn't include the other players in the region. The right? IOC. Uh, no, not well. Yes, but that's it's uh, not just focused on this region, but for this region, for the Middle East, how will it manage its own mm-hmm. affairs without outside dominance, without in- outside intervention, if it doesn't have the mechanisms for dialogue with the key players within the region itself? I think we started to see the beginnings of such uh, a body. Let, let's put it this way, or a process, and and the. Uh, insert in Libya when uh, the Arab League decided to have this dialogue between the Arabs and the uh, neighboring countries. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was, I think, less than one year ago. Yeah. That's one example of calling for it. Another happens every year at the IISS mm-hmm. conference in Manama, just okay. uh, took place. Every year, uh, usually Bahrain or one of the uh, GCC countries says, we need to create the Gulf Security Conference. It needs to have all of the relevant players there from the neighboring powers. But it doesn't happen. Why not? It needs to happen. That secretariat needs to be created. Those players need to be What are the deficiencies you think that preventing this from happening? I think, unfortunately, there is still too much pressure that comes perhaps from the United States and from others to not go in that direction. Mm -hmm. But The theme of what I've said is taking over responsibility. And there is also, of course, countries in the region that don't want to give up that animosity. And I think that that is also a big problem. I'll go go back to the uh, borderless Middle East and I'll take two examples. Iraq versus Sudan, for example. Because Sudan, you know, as you mentioned, we have, we're just one month away from the referendum on the uh, partition of Sudan. There is this theory that says the enhancement of the political system in Iraq and raising the level of political participation to a certain extent with all the deficiencies that that exist at this moment. This process actually maintained the integrity of Iraq as a one state. Whereas in Sudan, uh, when you weren't able to enhance the political system, where you weren't able to enhance the degree or the threshold of uh, political participation and, and uh, liberalizing the system itself, you end, you are ending up falling in the trap of partition. So you have these two two schools of thinking: mm-hmm. one that puts the the uh, political enhancement mm-hmm. on on level one, and mm-hmm. that puts partition on level one. There is also the factor of experience: the Iraq War has obviously been very scarring to all of the citizens of Iraq and they've suffered uh, immeasurably. And I don't think that that can immediately be put aside just by attempting to liberalize the internal political system, which, by the way, is is not really the case because we still see so many restrictions on the internal political activities. And in a way, it's actually similar rather than different from Sudan because we have seen the undermining of stability from within. Mm -hmm. I think, again, this is a matter of taking responsibility. Uh, The government of Khartoum and the campaigns that it has waged and the decades, really, now, internal conflicts in the country, three of them, really, ongoing at the same time, Darfur in the east and the south, Mm -hmm. it's not going to be forgotten. And now, already, we see the movement in the government of South Sudan, just as we see it in Kurdistan, towards saying, we cannot live in this status quo, we will not trust that the system will be inclusive, because quite frankly, there's been very little evidence that it will be. 
And that is the responsibility of those governments to own up to the fact that they have not created an, an, uh, an, uh, an integrated system, an inclusive system, and therefore people want out. Mm -hmm. That's a lesson. And it's a lesson that goes back to your very, very first point, which is what happens if minorities and, and, uh, and ethnic groups are not properly included in the order? You have non-stop turbulence. If, if I may exaggerate a little bit, uh, the major problem in, in the Arab world or in the Middle East, based on how you define Middle East, what are the borders of the Middle East, but the major problem in the Arab world is Iran, or it's the nickname of any other problem in the Middle East or in the Arab world. Uh, do you think that your theory of borderless Middle East is, is viable, is possible in this part of the world before resolving the political and, and um, uh, influence question with Iran? Yes, I do. And which, which comes first? Solving the problem with Iran right. or enhancing the, the roots that you were presenting a while ago? For, for decades, the prevailing mentality in many parts of this region has been we cannot move forward on regional integration, on unity, on all of these things because of Israel and because of Palestine. And now, it's, we cannot move forward on this agenda because of Iran. Mm -hmm. When will the excuses stop? To be perfectly blunt about it. When will the excuses stop? Iran is not going to dominate this region. There are very inherent uh, religious, cultural, ethnic, historical, political, geopolitical barriers and limitations that are in place. So I don't view it as an excuse. And let me also say again that it is a geographic fact. I often have to tell Americans that the Iraq war was not your bad war over here in Afghanistan, your good war over there. One country sits in between them, only one, and that is Iran. And then I tell them about their sanctions policy. I say, do you really think that this energy-rich country that is so large, that borders so many neighbors, that you should be building pipelines around it? Pipelines are 40-year, 50-year long investments. Does it really make sense to try and circumvent this country? Will it work? Absolutely not. I don't think so. I think that the process of creating some kind of limited but step-by-step